Who is he? He exists in a world beyond your world. So how do I find him? You don't find him. He finds you. Ever heard of Operation Swordfish? Nope. This is a sweet deal. Nine and a half billion. Do you have any idea of how much money that is? Gabriel's a patriot of sorts. I think that you think I'm a bank robber. The truth is that I'm worse. I have been told that the best crackers in the world can do this in 60 minutes. I need someone who can do it in 60 seconds. You're kidding. Go! You don't shut me up. I'll just talk about John all day, so... <laughs> you run him over there. Stan! <laughs> what happened, Stan? <laughs> My buttons go off! Marco, let's give him some incentive. Who are you supposed to be? I'm Ginger. I'm not what you think I am. The nudity thing scared me to death. One word on the page just said, kaboom. Hold on! It's like being a big kid with the best toys. I love the process of making movies. I mean, I always... <laughs> oh, my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, one. Too bad, you gotta die. No, 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 wait, wait! Not everything ends the way you think it should. Oh, boy. You know the problem with Hollywood is? They make unbelievable, unremarkable. There's only a few movies I've ever done where I knew immediately. The rest I think I had to work up to, meaning how would I do this? No, it's easy to pick apart bad acting, short-sighted directing, and the purely moronic stringing together of words that many of the studios term as prose. No, I'm talking about the lack of realism. Realism. Not a pervasive element in today's modern American cinematic vision. The first three, four pages captured me and said, OK, I really want to make the rest of this movie work because of that opening dialogue. I thought it was fabulous. Bad guy can't win. It's a morality tale. One way or the other, he's got to go down. Hmm. Well, life is stranger than fiction sometimes. I never really want to tell John this, but of course I grew up watching his movies, you know. <laughs> when Pulp Fiction came out and Get Shorty, I was then studying and becoming a professional actor, and he was my idol again. How did you keep a straight face? I have no idea. Let's go again, guys. Move. I won't say it again. All you get your clues from in a script is from what is written on the page and then you take those clues and you connect them to other dots in the movie to make other things happen. It was a different take, I thought, on this kind of action film. What countries will harbor terrorists when they realize the consequences of what I'll do? Did you know that I can buy nuclear warheads in Minsk for 40 million each? Hell, I buy half a dozen, I even get a discount. Gabriel isn't just a bad guy. I mean, he's not the bad guy or the baddest guy who wears the blackest hat, you know? I've changed my identity so many times, I don't even know who I am anymore. How could you turn on me when we were so close to our you goal? Did, you did this to yourself. That, I think, is what's interesting about him, is he's a very sort of multi-dimensional character who keeps unraveling. And you, the more you find out about him, I think your perspective on him changes. I flew 1,500 miles for this meeting. How about we uh, get to the point? No, you actually flew 1,500 miles for $100,000, but that's not the point. Helga, meet Stanley. When we decided to go after Travolta, I thought he was perfect. I thought, geez, if he doesn't do this, who in the hell are we going to get to do this? Look, you want something from me, and I want something from you. DOD, D-Base, 128-bit encryption. What do you think? Impossible? Well, nothing's impossible. Good. So it can be done? Can we slide in a Trojan horse hiding a worm? Something like that. Is this an interview? Sort of. Marco. Now, there aren't that many people who sort of can play that sort of charming, suave, stab you in the back, hey. I'll manipulate you, I'm Casanova, I'm, uh, you know, a uh, 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 Patton. Three, two, one. Too bad. You gotta die. No, 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 wait, wait. Gabriel's the master puppeteer. He's whatever you want him to be. We wanted to make him kind of like a more of a European-looking character. He is 
being someone else, he is undercover, kind of. The suits, the haircut, and this choice, there is this look that some European international playboy types, that jet set group, I mean, certainly some actors have had. Oh, yeah, that's him. And we all knew that it was the character. He's just got that coolness about him, you know, and he's a character that knows exactly what's going on five steps ahead of anyone else. Have you ever heard of Harry Houdini? Well, he wasn't like today's magicians who are only interested in television ratings. He was an artist. He could make an elephant disappear in the middle of a theater filled with people. And do you know how he did that? Misdirection. The idea of deception in this movie starts really with my character not being who he appears to be. I'm playing Gabriel Shears, but probably he's Joe Hardy of the ex-CIA. Is that too high? How's it look, Doc? It's good. What's going on? We've got a tail. Hold on. This movie goes for broke. Good, good work. Check the game. I'm now fully registered as a stunt driver and doing 90s reverse 180s, back things, 130 miles an hour and losing control of the car. Yeah, it's kind of a fun ride. You either shoot me or tell me why you're wearing that wire can't do that. Each person in this movie is on sort of a solo journey. You know, they each are in it for very different reasons. And I think the beauty of it for me is at the end of the day, hopefully you will see that. Who are you, Ginger? I can't tell you. She's the ultimate manipulator, that character. She turns on a dime and she is amazing at it and she's sexy, and she's funny, and she's deadly serious. She can just change like that. I thought you were Gabriel's. I'm not what you think I am. Ginger? Ginger, you don't really know, but you get a feeling that there's something going on with Ginger that's really important to her. You surprised that a girl with an IQ over 70 can give you a heart on? Although she's sexy and she's supposed to be a femme fatale, I wanted to make her human, but she's also very smart. She's very computer savvy. And that was really important. I thought, like, if I'm going to be topless, at least let me, you know, know something. <laughs> that, part again, of the, huh? that part of the movie's over. <laughs> right Never got to worry about that again. Never, right? Yeah, until it comes out for every day of the rest of my life. Sure. For someone the NSA once listed as the most dangerous hacker in America, sure don't look like much. Stanley's no angel. He never was an angel. Even if he's kind of politically minded and a bit of a Robin Hood, he's got a past which is probably not what you consider um, school prefect material, you know. You're a felon. You work a dead end job. And you desperately want to get your daughter back. Gabriel is your only shot. This particular movie was a very unique experience. So it was, I, I think I was more excited than usual because there were things about it that are really fresh. In the 1950s, J. Edgar Hoover started a secret organization, a kind of personal black ops. This was to protect the freedoms of this country at all costs. I don't care about any of this. All I care about is my daughter. I'm talking about your daughter. I'm talking about you and your daughter and 200 million other Americans who take their freedoms for granted. I always kind of say that you know, when I read a script that I want to see, that's the kind of movie that I want to make. So you and your band of lunatics are really stealing all this money just to protect me. Thank you. Thank that's you. right, Stanley. Because wars cost money. When you end up here, the genre that you can be, go to center stage, who are we at war with? And then you see it, and the camera goes from here, ooh, and we reveal the whole thing. Dominic Senna, who's the director of the picture, just did Gone in 60 Seconds, really was very interested in creating a unique feel for the movie and a unique look for the movie. And it has all that going for it. Cut! Good one! We agreed ahead of time that it should be this sort of a 
good looking, you know, upscale sort of Euro fashion looking movie, you know, that people look good and they smell good, they, they're in interesting looking places. So uh, we just took that as our cue, you know. And just as you fire, Donald takes you down the next sec, you know, like it beat too late. If you have great action producer, great action director, wonderful actors that you can work with like Hugh Jackman and Halle Berry, then you have something that will take off. God, it's been years since I've used one of these. <laughs> <laughs> a little rusty. You, you want me to shoot the camera? Person. Oh, sorry. And with Don Cheadle and Sam Shepard and Vinnie Jones, it's sort of all come together to have really st strong players. Hugh is an Aussie. So, you know, you have to give him a break right off the bat. Danger, danger, danger. He's illiterate. That makes it tough. So there's a lot of cue cards around the set and people, you know, shout, you know, trying to say the lines to him quietly. He's always got the prompter. He's got like that ear prompter thing. You know, he does a great Wolverine impression. I don't, I don't think he's going to be too good in this film. If I knew you were coming, I might have cleaned up a little. I've been lucky. This is my fourth uh, movie that I've done and the previous three have all gone to number one. So it's, it hasn't been a bad start, really. <laughs> It was a really incredible group of players who came together that were all really perfect for what we were doing. It's hard for me not to get excited. Cool. Never in any of his movies, including The Matrix, The Matrix to Come, or The Ma oh. <laughs> Fabulous. Joel is one of the most, one of the best producers in the business. John and I were just comparing notes on that. All the goodies that come with a big Joel Silver action movie. Sex, violence, and rock and roll. <laughs> There are two specific challenges in the film that are uh, exciting for me, at least. One involves what's known as a still array, where we have a couple of hundred cameras wrapped around an intersection photographing uh, a rather extensive event, the explosion that's happening out in the intersection. We can photograph the, the explosion itself at 1,000 frames per second and watch it physically expand and then photograph cars that are flying through the air, the stunt people, and other components such as shattering glass so that you photograph these at all their appropriate speeds and then when you layer them all up, they all work together as kind of a ballet. The original ending uh, took place in an airport where he, he went where he said he was going to go and then there's sort of a shootout and, and it seemed like uh, it should be smarter. And then we just said, well, where the hell do we go and what do we do now? We're in a bus. I thought we were going to the airport. Misdirection, Stan. Jeff Mann, my production designer, I think, he said, well, what if there's some big chopper or something? And you go, big chopper. And you go, oh, wait a minute, yeah. Control, be advised that this is now an aerial pursuit. Whoa, well, why don't we sever the cables? You know, you go, oh, okay, yeah. And why don't we crash it through a sign? And then why don't we plow through a building? And, and we're going, and nobody will ever give us permission. Nobody's this nuts. And they said yes. If you stand underneath that sky crane helicopter, if it's, say, 50 feet above you, it'll pound you right into the tarmac. It'll just, it'll kill you. Boom. It's so powerful. And the minute it gets airborne to the time it approaches the final building, which is quite a few shots and quite a long sequence, was done in one shooting day. Well, yeah, the idea is in the perfect world, we see the reflection going, and when he bangs, he goes over the lens. So we see the undercarriage over the lens. No one could be there. We had to shut down the street completely, and then we had to repopulate it with extras. All right, background action, tasting. It's not on a helicopter. It's coming at you. You know, so it was a major undertaking. We had like 12 camera crews, and they were hopscotching. Yeah, you have two hours here, and then you got to get out of there because the, the lady who lives in the high-rise to call the mayor. Well, so they were just constantly moving ahead and getting in the position. It was pretty insane. I don't know how he pulled it off. We just keep trying to make them better and make them, you know, exciting and thrilling and, you know, give people a real wild ride. And if we did that, then we've done our job. It's not gonna end like this. Ah, oh, come on, Stan. Not everything ends the way you think it should. Besides, audiences love happy endings. Oh, no.